So anyways, uh, we're in the Credo series. Um, I'm, I'm finishing it up today. Uh, the last two lines of the Credo series is what we're going to be talking about, resurrection of the body, life everlasting. But I'm aware of the fact that there are people that don't know who I am, um, which is, is funny for the people who do know I am, but it's not funny for the people who don't. They're like, I don't get it. Um, but my name is David, and I've been going to Living Streams since 1984 when I was five years old, sort of. Um, I actually was there, uh, you know, with, in the living room of the Buckleys, and, uh, and then I took about a 10-year off break um, because my family moved to Oregon, and uh, we were up there for a, a long time, and then in 2001, I came back to work at Living Streams to be a youth pastor here, and, uh, and I've, I've just been here since, um, so that's 21, 22 years now I've been working here, but the trick is I, my wife and I quit every six years. Um, on purpose, because um, we don't want to get fired. No, that's not why. But we quit, and we take our family um, away for a year to do foreign missions. That's just kind of a rhythm of life that we've um, put in our, our lives. And, uh, and so I just three weeks ago, we just got back from a year in Ireland um, where we were working and serving in a small farm town called Tipperary Town. And, uh, and so we're back and, and going forward and all of those things here. So that's a little bit of, of who I am. And now what's exciting is I'm actually getting to be a part of planning our 40th anniversary at Living Streams. So not this September, yeah, but next September, this old church turned 40, you know, um, from a living room at the Buckleys to where we are today. And hopefully there's another 400 years to go or so. Um, but it is, it's really exciting because Christians have the most stuff to celebrate, so we should be the best at celebrating. And so we're trying to figure out what, what that looks like for us to celebrate 40 years of God's faithfulness, 40 years of God's um, blessing, and, and then also try and really live into what a 40-year-old, if you got to be pretty mature when you turn 40. You know, and we want to really make sure we're growing into being a really mature church. And we're not the best church by far. There's way better churches out there somewhere. Um, but we're trying to really be a, a healthy local church that creatively expands God's kingdom. Um, and we want to make sure we're still pushing hard in both those ways as we're going forward. So anyway, it's a fun time to be a part of Living Streams. We'll try and bring back some old school Living Streamers um, for that weekend and celebrate. I, I don't know what it is. I'm not planning the party. I'm a horrible party planner. But I just, I'm, I like celebrating, so somebody else plan the party, and I'll, I'll do the celebrating. But anyways, this, this is also a setup for us in our Creed series, because what the Creed is, is now taking us into is resurrection in the body and life everlasting, which is, is alluding to this greatest celebration ever, called the marriage feast of the Lamb. It is the culmination of everything. It is where all of the Old Testament saints who believed that God would provide a sacrifice for their sins, all of the New Testament saints who believed God did provide a sacrifice for their sins, all of those who are alive and remain when Jesus returns, all of them coming together at one moment and having a party, having a God-planned party, one that was planned before the foundation of the world. The marriage feast of the Lamb. And that will usher in new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, all of those things that we read about and just go, wow, that is not describing today. <laughs> um, we still have a lot of battle. We still have a lot of challenge. But that's, that's the celebration. That's all of time. All of creation is, is, is headed towards this moment of culmination, um, the celebration of all celebrations. So, as our practice has been, we're, if you guys would stand up with me, we're going to read the creed together. Um, and I want you to stand, and the, 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 the reason for that is because in some ways we um, are trying to step into and stand up into the role that we have in our time, in our space, to be people of faith, to carry on what the heroes of faith have done before us. It's now our turn to be the heroes of faith today for the people who come after us. And so that's the standing into that and citing this creed. It's like, okay, we are the people of faith. It's not a new faith. It's the same faith. We're just living on. So if you'll recite this with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 
He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Amen. So what we're doing today is we are, with these two last phrases, we're entering into something called eschatology. Everybody say that word. Yeah, you, you feel pretentious every time you say it. You probably should. But really all it is, it's just a word that describes a, a, a focused part, a part of theology that focuses on last things or final things. Um, and, and those final things, some of them could be death, judgment, really the, the, the final destiny of all humanity, of all of creation. It, it's, it's a study that focuses on that aspect, what the Bible teaches, what orthodox faith, what the apostles taught um, as they carried forth the apostles' doctrine leading us to today an understanding of those final things. So that's all it is. The word eschatology, you say it, and people will be like, whoa, you know. But that, that's all it is. And I've been actually surveying people. Um, I, I love to say this. I say, hey, I, I, can I ask you some questions about your eschatology? Um, and it is just so funny what happens. And maybe because I'm a pastor and people just automatically feel bad when a pastor's around. I don't know. But um, anyways, I, was, I have been asking people and they just are like, what does that mean? You know, it's, it's most of the thing. And, and so I tell them, they're like, oh, they do have thoughts about those things. It's just a fancy word. Um, and then they start to tell me their thoughts. And, and I would say most people that I've talked to, I mean, we're talking about like 30 people. We're not, it's not like hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, but most people I talk to, they, they basically, um, they feel intimidated. Um, they feel confused. They, they try and boil it down to, well, I just, I just think, you know, Jesus is going to take care of it, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, and, and all of that. And again, I, these aren't right or wrong answers. That's just the reality of where people are at. And, uh, and I think it's interesting because the Bible is so full of eschatology. Old Testament, New Testament, life of Jesus. Um, we, you guys have heard the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus did just as, as actually a, a larger sermon, really, on, on the Olivet Discourse, on a different mountain in a different situation where Jesus is basically just teaching only about final things. Um, and, and every one of the writers in the New Testament basically has a portion of their writings to the church that deals specifically with eschatology. So, I mean, it's everywhere. It's all over there. But... I'm not trying to say it's not confusing. You read Jesus' Olivet Discourse and you're like, okay, I've heard some of that stuff before, but I don't really know what to do right now. And, that, and that's fine. So I, but, I, but what I'm saying is it's, it is very important in the life of a believer to wrestle with these things. All of, all of the people that were apostles, all of the followers of Christ, they had a very, very specific understanding that Jesus could return at any minute. And they lived their lives accordingly. And they weren't wrong. But yeah, they were. Jesus didn't come back. Yes, I know. I'm not saying Jesus came back and we missed it or something. But they weren't wrong to live their life that way. No man knows the day or the hour. And Jesus even made it sound like he didn't even know when the day or the hour was. But the, but the return of Christ is something that is supposed to be at the forefront of our minds. It's supposed to be something that frames our entire existence. And so I'm going to try and bring that a little bit more to the forefront right now as we go, as the creed does this already. Um, what's interesting about the creed is it's, it itself is full of eschatology. What, you, what we just recited is just dripping with eschatology. First and foremost, it says we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And so there's this separation into heaven and earth. All of a sudden, we're starting to get into some uh, interesting territory. 
heaven being not the place where God lives because God created them, so God actually dwells outside and inside those realms. But there's this separation, heaven and earth. And then if you follow scripturally, you know there are principalities and powers of the air. There are angels and demons that seem to inhabit some sort of realm. And then there's us over here. And we have our own governments, you know, and Joe, Joe Biden's the head of the American government. And, and then you, it seems like you've got the devil kind of the head of the government of the, the, the demon part. And then you've got these angels and really God is the kind of head of this other part. It's just this whole kind of thing that goes throughout the whole of scripture. It's not just Old Testament, it's New Testament as well. So bam, we're already lost, right? We're already like, I just said the creed and now I'm just, I have no idea what's happening anymore. That, but that is, that's eschatology. It's, there's more than just what we're dealing with here in our time and space. You continue on and then it talks about Jesus who descended into the, the realm of the dead or hell sometimes it says. Jesus descended, Right? That's eschatology. That's like, what are you talking about? It's eschatology. And then he, you know, resurrected and he hung out for 40 days. And then he ascended into heaven where he sat down at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Eschatology, right? Am I, I mean, yes? I know you never, I, know, I know you probably read the creed and you were like, I didn't know I was saying all that. But you're saying all of that. And then ultimately it ends with the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, which we're dealing with today. So it's just dripping with eschatology. Our faith is so informed and made alive by eschatology, the hope that we have. I love it. They say, you know, faith, hope, and love are the three that remain. Faith takes care of the past. Hope takes care of the future. So we're left to just love in the now. And we need to have a robust hope if we're going to be able to celebrate like we're supposed to. We need to have a robust hope if we're going to actually do the work that we're called to do. We need to have a robust hope, otherwise the cares and heaviness of this world will ruin us. And so I, I made a timeline, because I love timelines so bad, and I asked Dan Riccio, is anything on this make you uncomfortable? <laughs> he said no. I asked Dalton, who's the maker of all slides, um, <laughs> could you make me a slide? And he said, no way. And then he said, he did it. And so this is, the, this is a slide. And I actually had about five other slides, but they didn't make it in Sunday morning. They'll make it in maybe Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we're going to do a deeper dive. So this is going to be, this is going to leave you so unsatisfied, my message today. You're just going to be like, what was the point of that? Well, Wednesday is where we have more time and we're going to be able to dive into some stuff. We'll get some fuller perspective. And if we need to do like six more Wednesdays after that, that's fine. But you'd have to come and show up and let me know that that's something you want. So anyways, so um, here's the timeline. It's very small words because it was impossible what I asked Dalton to do. But I'll read it. So, heaven and earth and Sheol. The only reason I put Sheol on there, because Sheol seems like it would actually be more part of the heaven realm, but that gets a little confusing come Wednesday night. But I put it there just because it's, it's the abode of the dead. So, Jesus, his arrow is going this way because he's eternal. We are not eternal. We have a beginning. We're everlasting. We have no end. God is eternal. No beginning and no end. It's a difference. So, Jesus out of nowhere, incarnated and became one of us. He landed on our sod. He took on human flesh. He felt what we felt. He knew what we knew. He, he became one of us. The most fascinating thing that maybe has ever happened. And he walked among us, and he lived a sinful life, and he taught us about who God is and how we can relate to him. And then he died. He died on a cross, and he descended into hell. Now, a picture that Jesus gave in a parable, which you can't really use parables to, to do sound theology. You have to be careful of that. But I'm just going to put this picture that Jesus put in the mind of his disciples. And it's the story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And rich man and Lazarus, rich man, everything's great. Lazarus has a tough time. But when they die, Jesus said that they went down into Hades or Sheol, the abode of the, of the dead. And, and the, the rich man was in a place of misery. And there was a chasm that separated him and Lazarus, who was now by Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. Um, and it was paradise. 
And the rich man was saying, Abraham, can you send Lazarus over to, 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 to quench you know, my thirst kind of deal? And Abraham's like, no, there's a great chasm between us. And there's more to the story. But basically, there's this picture. So in some ways, you can look at um, this Jesus descending into this place of the dead. And there in the place of the dead, you have all the people that had lived prior to that. And when they died, they either believed that God would provide a sacrifice for their sin. That's what you know, Abraham said when he and Isaac were going up the mountain. Isaac said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And he said, God himself will provide a sacrifice. And so the, the faith that there would be one who would come to pay that price was what they believed. In New Testament, we look back and say, we, we believe that God did, and it all culminates in Christ. So those Old Testament believers separated in that way. This is, now, don't get too crazy on this, but this is just a little bit of a, of a helpful picture. And so Jesus descended into hell, and we have verses like, you know, he took captivity captive, or he preached good news to those who were in prison. or whatever. And so there's this idea that it's possible that Jesus, when he descended, he went down to those people by Abraham's side, and he said, hey, you guys all believed that one was coming. Hey, it's me. I'm the one. I'm the guy. And they, at that point, were taken from that place into the Father's house, where Jesus, you know, if you're back to the timeline, he resurrects, 40 days he's hanging out, and then he ascends to the right hand of the Father, where he's hanging out, and Acts chapter 3 basically says he's sitting there until the Father decides to send him back and bring about the refreshing, is what it says in Acts chapter 3, which is beautiful. And that's the return of Christ, which then culminates at marriage feasts of the Lamb. Anybody, you can woo on that. That's the word wooing. Marriage feast of the Lamb, and then you know, we usher into whatever new heaven and new earth looks like at that point. So, now, you don't have to, you don't have to deal with this anymore. You can take that away. Um, but that's just a little bit of how we're kind of trying to move into some of this space. So now we'll go into our specific phrases. Resurrection of the body. A simple seminary definition of resurrection of the body um, would be the belief that like Jesus... His followers will experience life after death, and like Jesus, it will be physical as well as spiritual. So again, as a part of this eschatology, there's a question that the apostles address in the creed is, what happens to us after we die? And I was just, um, I was just at the Black River. Anybody been to the Black River? We need to do a field trip. The whole church going to the Black River. Um, it's eastern Arizona, and uh, it's, it's just, it's one of the, it's got to be one of the best places in Arizona. But um, I was just there with some, with some guys, um, and we were fishing, and, and it's a little embarrassing because it's like super nerdy Christian situation. But we're by the fire, and instead of telling ghost stories, I just started asking them eschatology questions, <laughs> which sometimes feel a little like ghost stories if you keep reading through the Bible, Right? Um, and it was just so fun because we were asking all these questions. And, uh, and one of the questions that one of the guys asked, um, I won't tell you who, but he said, well, we have hair in heaven. <laughs> and I was like, there's a lot of questions you could ask. This is literally what we're dealing with. Will we have hair in heaven? And uh, I actually loved it. I thought it's so perfect because when, when we talk about the resurrection of the body, um, I can answer that question, yes, we will have hair in heaven. How can I answer that question? Well, the first part of this belief thing is that we believe that like Jesus. Because everything stems from, well, Luke 24, when those, those people went to the tomb, they saw the stone rolled away, and when they went inside, Jesus wasn't there. His body wasn't there. That is such a significant verse in the Bible. His body wasn't there. We sang about it in one of those songs today. His body wasn't there. Now, Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. So we can actually look and see what happened in Jesus in those 40 days. That is a glimpse as to what's going to happen for us. We follow him into his death and resurrection as followers of Christ. And so when we die, we will experience resurrection life like Jesus did. And our body 
will be a part of whatever glorified state we end up in. And so Jesus, if you look at what his life happened after that, that time of death, after the resurrection, Jesus, didn't, he, he was walking around and people recognized him as a human, but they didn't recognize him as Jesus necessarily. So somehow we're going to be both like seeming very natural, like when Jesus showed up to the guys that he was walking with to Emmaus, they weren't like, oh, Martian, weird thing. They were just like, what's up, dude? You want to walk with us? And they go walking with him. They didn't recognize it was Jesus, though. So there is a difference. And some of you are like, hallelujah, I don't want to look like this anymore. But that's where I'm like, I think we can safely say that, yeah, Jesus had hair probably at that point. Because it would have been weird from not to, maybe. I don't know. But then when he broke bread, all of a sudden they recognized him. It's Jesus. So somehow recognizable, not recognizable, you get what I'm saying there? And I don't know, but then Jesus could like disappear. He could just like show up places and disappear. So I don't know if like breaking the bread is like you have to break bread to be able to do that. I think that would be in line with a lot of Christian history. Breaking bread is really important. But Jesus broke bread and then he was like, poof, out of there. And then at one point he just appears in a room where the disciples were all gathered. And he talks to them. You can talk. You can interact. You have physical reality to you. But in that moment, remember, Jesus still had the scars in his hands and his feet. I don't know exactly what that means. It could mean that somehow the scars that we get in this life as acts of love, not the scars that sin and all those things cause to us, but the scars when we really get it right and we love someone sacrificially and it creates a scar, maybe somehow those are still going to be there. But they're not going to be seen as ugly things. They're going to be the most beautiful part of heaven. When we see those scars in Jesus' hands, it's basically like we're looking at a wedding ring knowing that those scars represent a loving covenant between us and him that will never end. One thing that's really important to me is when you see Jesus in those 40 days, he's eating almost every time you see him. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> eating. Marriage feast of the lamb. Let's go now. Let's go now. Um, one other thing that's really important to me is um, one of the guys by the campfire asked, will there be fishing in heaven? And uh, I feel pretty good about it, yes. And let me tell you why. Because one of the times Jesus showed up after the resurrection, um, the disciples were out in a boat fishing and catching nothing. And they look over and they see a guy cooking some fish. And John says, it's the Lord. And Peter throws off his coat, jumps in the water, swims over there. And Jesus has a little time with his disciples over some fish. Now, where did he get those fish? He was fishing right before there, right? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Come on now. I hope so. Um, but anyways, that's a little fun that we're having. But I really do think the reason that we have all these scriptures about Jesus after resurrection is because God's wanting us to get excited about what our future is all about. And we can learn from that and we can know from that what it's going to be like to some extent, to some extent. It's still all a guess in a lot of ways. Um, so a more complicated definition of resurrection of the body would be a resurrected body is not a resuscitated body. But a body which after death has been glorified by the power of God, freed of its sinful nature, real and material, but not earthly or mortal. It's recognizable as human, but new in appearance and ability. And I'll read 1 Corinthians 15, um, a little passage there. 1 Corinthians 15 is actually like, I think it might be the longest chapter in the New Testament. And it's all eschatology, interestingly enough, about resurrection of the body. But here in this part it says, But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? 
How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and the stars differ in their splendor. So will it be in the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural, but it is raised a spiritual body. And that is true, but I don't want you to miss that when it says raised a spiritual body, it's not just some kind of chubby cherim playing a harp on a cloud. It's not what we're talking about. It is a spiritual glorification reality, but it also has a body. A practical reality, a physical reality as well. So that's resurrection of the body. You with me? You want to do life everlasting? Yeah, yeah. Life everlasting. Simple seminary definition. The belief that the final destiny for followers of Jesus will be life without the shadow of death forevermore. You and I have never taken one breath without breathing in death. Not even a moment. The best moment of your life was under the shadow of death. The worst moment was too. And one day, death will be gone. And we will be free. Life everlasting. That word life has a lot of meat to it. A more complicated definition of life. Life or or, or life everlasting. Life which has a beginning but has no end. Without the shadow of death upon it, always at full bloom. Perpetual bloom. And sustained and powered by the infinite life of the author of life himself. Jesus is the author of life. A life that doesn't run out. A life that laughs in the face of death. Life everlasting. The scriptures um, that speak to that, Matthew 25, 23 is a parable that Jesus told where he's separating sheep and goats on that Olivet discourse. And, and he says to the sheep, he says, he says, well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into your master's happiness. I love that phrase. We will step into the full joy of the Lord. And then Revelation chapter 21, many of you are familiar with it. Um, Revelation 21 verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, and no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. It's life everlasting. It's the promise Jesus made to us. It's what he purchased through his death and resurrection. I have a couple more um, people who have attempted to describe life everlasting that I just, I chew on these all the time. Um, I have a number of these up in my office or in my house because I really want, I really want the hope that we have to be in the forefront to shed light on every single decision I make. Multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision, but the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. There's a verse in the Bible, but here's what John Foreman says about that life everlasting. He says, until the sea of glass we meet, at last completed and complete, the tide of tear and pain subside and laughter drinks them dry. 
enter into my master's happiness. Opus Dei, this website, just defines everlasting life this way. Everlasting life is what gives ultimate and permanent meaning to human life, to ethical commitment, to generous de dedication, to self-sacrificing service, to the effort to communicate Christ's doctrine and love to all, so all souls. Without a robust eschatology, you're going to be weak in all these areas. J.R.R. Tolkien, he wrote a book one time. The beauty of it smote his heart as he looked up at the forsaken land and hope returned to him. For like a shaft, clear and cold, the thought pierced him, and in the end, that in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing, and there was light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. I know some of you are literally feeling like you're going through hell right now. I just hope that today maybe you can lift your eyes up and see that this is not the end of the story. This is the valley of the shadow of death, but we're headed towards something else. And if you hang on to the shepherd's hand, you will make it. You will make it. And lastly, there's a guy named Tim Keller who went to be with the Lord just recently. And one time he wrote, everything sad will come untrue and somehow be better for having once been broken. And this is our hope. This is the hope we have in Jesus Christ. This is why he went through everything he went through so that we could experience the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. And it's him. It's him that does the work. We offer our sinful failures and he offers his robe of righteousness. And all he asks is that we just hang on to his hand. We continue to reach up for him every time we fall. And he's promised to get us a pure and spotless bride, to present us a pure and spotless bride before the throne. He knows how to get us there. Let's pray. And when I say let's pray, oftentimes I, I mean let's listen for the Lord, not just say things. But just take a moment and really see if he has something to say to you or maybe try and just distill down one thing from this message that you want to grab onto. And Right about now, your mind wants to start thinking about other things, but I would encourage you to just fight that and really let this hope work its way into those places of pain in your heart. Whoever has this hope purifies himself. Lord, I pray you'd fill your people with hope.